Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. And we're going to read verses 24 through 26. Acts chapter 24, starting in verse 24. And after certain days, when Felix, I love that name, Felix came with his wife Drusilla. That just sounds like a mean name, doesn't it? Uh, which was which was a Jewish, a Jewess. Uh, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, "Go thy way for this time. When I have convenient season, I will call for thee." He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul that he might lose him. Wherefore he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. Today we're going to talk about a subject that a lot of folks uh, do in their lives, but maybe not necessarily admit in their lives. Procrastination. But we'll get to that tomorrow. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Uh, we're going to talk about procrastination. Now, it's interesting, be honest, we all from time to time have a problem with procrastination. Amen? <laughs> You know, and, and the thing about that is, I always say I'm going to work on that tomorrow, right? Kind of like the new exercise regime that I keep thinking I'm going to do. Now, I have been on a diet for the last week, and uh, I've done pretty good. I, I don't know how much I've lost, but I feel like I've lost, and uh, so that's pretty good. You say, why are you on a diet? Hello? <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it always begins tomorrow. Um... It's interesting how sometimes even in politics and things of that nature around the world, we often wonder, we often talk about how people are procrastinating. Now in school, I know we've all, well maybe all of us, some of you were really good students, amen? And some of you were so good that you got your homework done on time, every time, and never had to do it in the class periods before it was actually due, right? Yeah, yeah, that was Miss Celinda. Everybody else was just like me and got it done somewhere between the night before and during the day before the class. Yeah, yeah, that's us, right? <laughs> and maybe you didn't get it done, right? The setting that we're talking about here is in Herod's uh, palace in uh, Caesarea. And the walls of the palace have witnessed a lot of bloody scenes. There's a lot of things that have taken place in this particular palace. <laughs> and it was Herod... Uh, here that Herod passed the sentence uh, 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 of his own two sons. So Herod uh, uh, pronounced the death sentence on his sons. Uh, a lot of Jews were brutalized there. And uh, <clears throat> it's interesting that now these walls are going to hear something that these walls have never heard before. They're going to hear a sermon. And it's not just any sermon. It's a sermon unlike it's ever, that's ever been preached, uh, that's ever been heard in those particular walls. Now, Keep in mind that Felix is the governor of Judea. He's wearing a royal red robe. He is all highfalutin. He's up there doing all that. He exercises his authority as a king. And not only that, he does it with the spirit of a slave. You say, what do you mean? You see, from a worldly perspective, Felix was a success story. He started out as a slave. He was born a slave. Later, he was freed. Okay? He worked his way up to governor of Judea, and a Roman historian, Tacitus, is who said he exercised the authority of a king with the spirit of a slave. He was cruel and covetous. Now, walking in behind him is Drusilla. Right? She walks in behind him, and she comes from a very wicked bloodline. As a matter of fact, she was the daughter of Herod Agrippa I. And it's the, she's the one who had the Apostle James put to death. And it was her great-grandfather, another Herod, who attempted to kill baby Jesus. Remember when he put out a decree that all the babies a uh, year older uh, and under were to be put to death? That was him. She was said to be the most beautiful woman in the first century. That's saying a lot. She was married first at the age of 14. And then one day, Governor Felix laid eyes on her and says, Ooh, i got to have her as my wife. So, he schemed to steal her away from her husband, and she eventually divorced him. And so now she's walking into this courtroom 
All eyes are on her. She's a looker. You ever, you ever heard that phrase? So now comes the Apostle Paul. He's surrounded by soldiers. So we're in our imagination. We're seeing the court all set up. Uh, here's, here's the king. Here's Drusilla. Here is now, here's now Paul coming in. He's all raggedy and, and rough looking. He's probably walking real stiff from the beatings that he's been taking from all the, the stonies. His body's probably not in very good shape. He's all shackled up and Roman soldiers are walking him in. With me so far? So it's interesting to know that, um, well, Paul stands before the man who had the power to set him free. So think about that. He's all beaten up, he's bruised up, and he's sitting before the man that had the power to set him free. But what's so interesting is, is that Paul was really the one that was free. It was Herod that was in the bondage. He was in bondage of sin. He was in bondage of, of, of no salvation. He was the one that was in the bondage. Now there's some people that would tell Paul, Paul, when you get to this governor, when you get to this king fella, you, you, you just tone it down. Don't, don't be preaching like you always preach. Amen? Yeah, just, just hang back a little bit. Don't go, after, don't go after him like you usually do. And the world would say that. But Peter may say, or Paul may say, no. Paul would say, I'm not going to do that. He knew the central issue was whether Felix was a believer in Christ or not. So he goes in there saying, okay, he's either saved or he's lost. That's where Paul was coming from. Now again, in some of those days, uh, prisoners may slip him a little money. And may say, here, have a little bribe, have a little money, let me go. Right? Not Paul. There was a court case in England. And there was a family that traveled down this, this unfinished road. They did, went the wrong road. They didn't know it, but it was unfinished. They had an accident. And the prosecution said the road was uh, clearly marked with a bright red flag. But the defendant said, no, it wasn't. So the ones that had the wreck said, you know what? Uh, it wasn't marked with a bright red flag. I have no idea. What, how are we supposed to know? So the judge looked at the uh, defendant and says, you bring me that flag and show me. And, I'll, and we'll decide from there. Well, sure enough, they bring the flag back. And it was a weathered, watered down looking color, almost pink faded. Very pale. Amen? Now, it's interesting <clears throat> that that red flag was meant to be there for a, a, a warning sign. Whenever you see red, it means warning, right? Red light means you better stop or you're in trouble, right? Uh, the railroad crossings, you see red, you're supposed to stop. Well, what if I don't stop? <laughs> Hello, right? So the next thing you know is we understand that red is there, but now he sees this flag and that flag is all pale pink. And it's interesting that the Word of God and preachers and teachers are supposed to be teaching the Word of God and we're supposed to be waving the red flag. Amen? We're supposed to be waving that red flag and saying, this is what we're going to have if we don't do whatever. Right? Whatever the Bible says. Whatever this says. Whatever that says. And the problem is, is that too many in today's pulpits, too many in today's world have watered down, sissified, vilified the Word of God and they've made it weak and ineffective. Amen. So now Amen. we've got people that are dying and go to hell. We say, well, they've got the Bible. How shall they know unless we preach to them? Amen. Amen. So Paul was going to raise the red flag. And we're told everything that Paul said. We're not told everything, but, but the basic outline and it's pretty powerful. And he's like any good Baptist preacher, right? He had three points. Now, I didn't see a story or a poem in here, but they always tell you in preacher school you should always have three points in a poem. Amen? And so he was a good preacher. Well, let's look at verse 25 in our text today. It says, And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment. Those are the three points that Paul had to give <clears throat> uh, to Felix. Righteousness, temperance, and judgment. That's his outline. So now we see a, a sermon outline right there. So what would Paul have said? Well, he reasoned with Felix of a righteousness he did not possess. 
You know, God is righteous and we're not. We say that, but do we really believe that? God is righteous, but we are not. Man appears, or what appears as righteousness in human view, the Bible says are like filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6. It says, but we are all an unclean thing, and all our righteous is, I had to say that slow, are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Friends, that's not, that's not God talking about our bad. That's God talking about our good. The very best we could be are like filthy rags. Everybody understand that? The world has become very disrespectful of the Lord. People will call him the man upstairs. I detest hearing that. There's the man upstairs. Well, in my house, that would be my son Josh. Right? He's the man that lives upstairs right now. Amen? He is a thrice holy God. There were some young people for a long time, and I hope they've gotten out of this, but they'll say... You know, JC, he's my homeboy. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Friends, that's, that's disrespectful. We need to reverence his name. We need to fear him. Amen? Now, here's the thing. If the President of the United States was to walk through the doors, we'd all stand. Now, some might pass out. Amen? We'd stand out of respect for the office of the President. Amen? But if Jesus walked in, we'd fall on our faces before Him because that's the only thing we can do. Amen. 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 Paul put the fear of God in Felix in verse 25 says he trembled. Friends, we need more preaching like that today. Amen. We need more preaching like that today. If we lift up our God to His rightful place, people would be under conviction and put in their place. Amen. The problem is people don't like that anymore. But I'll tell you what, that doesn't make it any less necessary to preach it. Amen? Amen. Friends, there is still a heaven to gain. There is still a, heaven, a hell to shun. There is still this world to live in. There is still a life with Christ to live in until He calls us home. And friends, it, mm, we... Mm, ooh, 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 hang on. Here we go. There's a lot of Christian musicians that are out there, and I praise God for them. There's some, but the problem with Christian musicians is they're trying to become more like the popular musicians of the day. Yes, yes. Friends, that's not sending the right message. They want to dress like them, look like them. And I want to tell you something, friends. The message we need to send lifts up God in the spotlight and gives Him the glory. And in humility, puts, and, 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 it puts us in our place. Amen? Amen. Friends, I'm glad Paul didn't try to pull God down to Felix's level. Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Friends, we know God loves sinners. That's the essence of the Gospel. Amen? You know, there's a lot of people that stop right there. God loves you. Yes, God is a God of love. He really is. But He also has to be a God of judgment. Part of His love is to have the judgment. You say, well, I don't understand that. Listen, we see sin differently than God does. You see, we brush over sin. We justify sin. We make sin look like it's pretty these days. Amen? We make it look like it's commonplace. But because it doesn't matter what we do to cover it up, sin is still a sin. Amen? Amen. I better not. Go ahead. I might as well have already thought Go it. ahead. Friends, you can cover a dog mess up, but it's still a dog mess under the cover. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. You can put a good coating on the outside of somebody and call yourself a Christian, but you're still the dog mess on the inside. Amen? Amen? Amen. I put that politely. I just want you to know that. <laughs> People say we people, you know, they'll call it weakness, but God calls it wickedness. It's not weakness, it's wickedness. Some say it's an accident. God says it's an abomination. Some say it's by chance, but God says it's by choice. 
Some say it's a trifle. God says it's a tragedy. That's what sin is. And I think Paul brought Felix face to face with God and Felix saw who he was in the face of God. And time and time again, we need to be before God so that we see the face of God and we understand who we are before God. Righteousness that he did not possess. But then there's the temperance he did not practice. Verse 25 talks about temperance. The word temperance means self-control. Anybody ever... Uh, <clears throat> Anybody ever talk about, and sometimes with people, sometimes it's food, right? Sometimes it's chocolate. Sometimes it's something, whatever it is, right? And there's, there's sometimes people say, I just can't control myself around this. I just can't quit, right? Anybody ever, anybody ever that way? We just do that. No self-control, amen? The problem in our society today is... Live for the day. Yep. Do what makes you feel good. Yeah. Right? No self-control. We already told you about how he got his wife, uh, Mr. Felix there. By the way, this would have been his third wife. And he was also a politician, and he took bribes. I know that's a unique statement in the world today. Okay? <laughs> I'm sure it doesn't happen very much around oh, the United States. Oh boy. Look at verse 20. I couldn't stop. I couldn't. I just kind of laugh about that. Verse 26, it said he hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul. You know, one reason why he held Paul so long was he was hoping that the believers would raise some money and offer it to him as a bribe to let him go. He was corrupt. He was a corrupt man. And he didn't hesitate to lie. Again, I don't know if our politicians are like that today, but there you go. Felix lied. He would murder. He would steal. He lived a life of parties and orgies and luxury. And so, so temperance and self-control was not something he was familiar with. Amen? You know, I have a feeling that Paul said, you're an adulterer, a thief, and a, and a murderer. And the Bible says, these cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Think about that. He was bold. He told him exactly where he was. Amen? And so, he, and so now I'm sure he turns his, his, his attention to Drusilla and pointed out how she sold out what it means to be a young lady. She gave up her modesty, her decency, and her purity. And those are important qualities for ladies to protect. Did you hear that? They're not to be put all over magazines in various states of undress. It's not ladylike. Well, that's old-fashioned being ladylike. No, it's not. Correct. Ladies be ladies. Men be men. Don't confuse the two. Yeah. Ladies, you need to keep your bodies covered. Men, you need to keep your bodies covered. And only uncover it for that man or that woman that you're married to that you say that for. Brother Don, you're just old-fashioned. No, I'm not. I'm biblical. Yep. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't want to believe it. Doesn't make it any less true. You won't win the argument with me. I'm sorry. Many people have never confronted, have never been confronted with the truth about how God feels about their lifestyle. And when they are, you hear names, don't you? How many times has somebody come into my office and said, Brother Don, I have seen such and such with such and such as wife. Brother Don, do I tell, do I tell, do I tell, um, I tell his wife. Anybody ever been told those secrets before? Brother Don, I, I, I have this, and Brother Don, I have that, and, <clears throat> and on and on and on and on it goes. Brother Don, what do I do? I used to never be very confrontational, but I tend to be confrontational when it needs to be done. 
And when somebody comes into my office, they'll hear the truth. You need to tell them the truth. Not that you're tattling on, but you need to go to that friend that's committing that act and say, you better straighten up or else. Say, Brother Don, that's judging. No, it's not. That's being a friend. That is loving somebody enough to tell them what they're doing wrong. Amen? Amen. Oh, I don't want to hurt their feelings. Are you kidding me? Feelings have nothing to do with it or else they wouldn't have had a problem. They wouldn't be doing what they're doing. This needs to be done wisely, though, as from God. It doesn't need to come from the church or the opinions of some old funny days. Amen? God's truth needs to be given. And that it's not a, it's not a credibility gap. Okay? Sometimes other people may have credibility issues, but God's Word doesn't. Okay? It's not an affair. It's adultery. It's not just premarital indiscretion. It's fornication. Those are biblical terms. And Paul was addressing Felix just like that. Some say, well, I have overactive hormones and I just got to sow my wild oats. God calls it sin. I'm sure Paul shared the other side too, which was of hope. Friends, he says you may not be able to control your passions, but God can. He can temper you and empower you to overcome. See, the problem is we don't want to. We don't want to do that. I can see Paul there when he's talking about sin. He says, "Greater is He that is in me than He that is in the world." He was bold about it. God is greater. By now, Felix has a lump in his throat. He says, what's going on here? I called this guy in here to judge him, and he's judging me. Paul was very logical. He was very much like a lawyer. And in his presentation, and he was laying out the facts, and he said, you need righteousness, you don't have it, but you can receive it as a gift. Your conduct is out of control. You're a sinner by birth, by nature, and by practice and choice. But God, your Creator, can bring you into line. Mm, wouldn't I, you'd love to sit there and hear that preaching. Amen? It was the last time we really realized who we were in Christ. Where we stood. Finally, he told him of a judgment he could not prevent. In verse 25, he very logically says, this is what God demands. Here's what you are. Here's the effect. Here's what's coming. Anybody ever heard of the, of a, uh, the cause and effect balance there? So you have this, this, will it cause this and affect this? Everybody know that cause and effect? Right? Mm -hmm. Felix, you're wicked. Felix, you're sinful. Here's the judgment to come. Because you have chosen that life. But you have the hope. You have a choice. You can choose the right way. Now it's very important for Felix to understand this because here he sits on the throne. He is high, he's wide, and he's handsome. Amen? He has money, power, beautiful wife, food, and he can easily feel like he's untouchable. Does that make sense? Sometimes if we're not careful, sometimes, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Everybody ever heard that? Yep. Again, if we get in our minds that we're untouchable, that's what Felix could do. He has to understand where he is. There's natural consequences for any of us. Amen? If you have sex out of wedlock, you might get a disease. If you take drugs, you'll destroy your brain and your organs. If you jump off a building... You're going to splat on the pavement. Right? Right. God's judgment of sin hasn't even arrived yet. But it's coming. It's coming. 
Romans chapter 2 verse 5 says this, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day, or, or, wrath against the day of wrath. Why is Felix even trembling? Paul's in chains for heaven's sakes. Because I believe that's the Holy Ghost conviction. You see, we don't like to feel the feeling of conviction. Amen? Amen. That's not something we enjoy. He could have gotten saved in this moment. Remember the Philippian jailer trembled with the same conviction. And he turned to Christ. But there was a problem. In verse 25, the devil wanted... Let's read the, verse 25, the last part of verse 25. It says, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. You know, that's all the devil wants you to do. Some say, well, the devil wants me to reject Jesus. The devil wants me to reject this, that, or the other. No, the devil just wants you to wait. Put it off. Wait till tomorrow. You don't necessarily have to reject it. Just wait to accept it. Anybody ever witnessed to somebody who agreed with you but procrastinated? I, I witnessed to a fellow when it was in Daytona Beach, Florida. We were, and I was, I was uh, presenting him the, the gospel. And just said, he said, I understand everything. I said, would you, would you like to pray and ask Jesus to save you? I think I'll wait. You do know that if you die before accepting Christ, that heaven's not your home. You just have the knowledge. You've not possessed the gift. Now, I understand. I just want to wait. Give me more time. I want to think about it. It's all the devil wants. Here's some dangers of waiting to be saved. First, you lose today. Do this before you die as if eternity is the only thing at stake. You lose today. You've lost that, that speech with Him. What did Felix gain by rejecting Christ? <clears throat> History will go back and tell us he died a miserable man. As far as we know, Felix never accepted Christ. Don't suppose you can wait for your deathbed to get saved. Somebody wrote this, I, I wrote this quote, it says, Don't burn your candle for Satan for years and then think you'll blow smoke at your Creator at the end of your life. God doesn't work that way. You're not promised tomorrow. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. None of us are promised tomorrow. Not many of us have digital or have Timing like Timex watches anymore, but every click of the watch, somebody dies. And one time that click will be ours. Exactly. Amen. But we don't know when. Amen? Amen. Friends, none of us are going to get out of this world alive. In spite of the medical marvels, the death rate is still one out of every one. Right? Three guys talked about how they wanted to be remembered when they died. Amen? First guy said, I want him to say he was a good father. Second one said, I want him to say I was a good husband. Third one said, I want him to say I'm just moving. Right? Ain't gonna happen. <laughs> the Bible says our life is like a vapor, like a blade of grass. Jesus could return at any moment. Matthew 24, 42, Luke 12, 40. All go on to say He'll come as a thief in the night. He we may not die. We may be translated immediately taken up in the rapture. God can stop knocking at your heart's door at any moment. J. Harold Smith used to preach a great message. He's in heaven now called God's Three Deadlines. And the basis of that message was you could send away your day of grace. And I've, and I've used this illustration before, but it bears repeating. God stands at our heart's door and knocks. And you say, no, not right now. And he 
keeps knocking. You say, Lord, I said not right now. I said no. And then no more. It's like if your doorbell battery died and people were coming over to your house. And then they come to you at church and they say, why didn't you answer the door? Now, me being the smart aleck I can be, he said, because I saw you at the window. But anyway, uh, but the thing is, why didn't you answer? Because I didn't hear the warning. Today, you're hearing the warning. And you're responsible to answer. Three times in Romans chapter 1, God it says that God gave them up or God gave them over. Hosea 4.17, Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. John 12.37, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. John 12.39, therefore they could not believe. No wonder the Bible says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Because the world may make it in your life where you'll never be able to find Him again. There was a demon convention and the topic was how do we keep people from getting shaved? Some people say, well, tell them there is no hell. Tell them there is no heaven. And then finally one of the demons spoke up and he says, <laughs> tell them there's no hurry. Friends, the, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. We need to lovingly compel our loved ones to Christ. Amen? So now I'm going to ask you a couple of questions today. Number one, is there something in your life today, Christian, that God has been talking to you about in your heart? That God has said, witness to this one. Witness to this one. I can't remember the preacher's name, but I'll, I'll find it. Preacher, I, did, I, read it, I read this just the other day. Preacher said he walked by this wonderful lady <clears throat> who was selling flowers, who had flowers on the side of the street. And God told him, you need to witness to her. You need to talk to her about, about, about me. And he disobeyed. He went by the same place about three or four days later. And at that time, she handed him a little <coughs> packet of information. And it was from the Moonies. You see, where he failed, Satan prevailed. Who are those loved ones we need to talk to about Jesus? Can I tell you something, friends? This thing called church is, is more than that. We're not about getting people to church. We're about getting them to Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's our whole goal. What has what is God laid on your heart and you have been putting off? Maybe you've been putting off uniting with this church. I don't know. Maybe it is. But maybe this is the time you come and join the church. Maybe God, maybe, maybe you've been putting off uh, <clears throat> surrendering your life to full-time Christian service. Don't know. Maybe you've, maybe you've uh, been procrastinating about addressing that particular sin that's in your life. I don't know. But whatever it is, you need to do it today. Amen? But then there may be some in this room who say, uh, you may be sitting like Felix was. You're trying to weigh the options, aren't you? You're trying to determine if it's really worth it to get saved or not. I want to tell you, it's a decision that will make an eternal difference in your life. And you may be on the, on the cusp. And you may be sitting there saying, Brother Don, I've never accepted Christ. Or Brother Don, I do not know. Brother Don, I've been putting it off. You need to get it done today. While He may be 